Welcome to the first installment in my Reflection Seismology 101 series. What is a seismic wave? This video starts at square one with the basics of the science. I try to appeal to common sense and intuition rather than heavy math. I assume you have a high school level physics background. Here's a video capture of a large dynamite explosion taken with a high speed camera. Here's a later frame. You can see the explosion mushrooming upward and outward but notice the strange disturbance that I've highlighted with red arrows. As I move to a later frame, it's clear that the disturbance is not part of the fireball. It's actually a supersonic shock wave moving at about 6,900 meters per second, which is the known speed of a TNT explosion. The shock wave expands away from the explosion in the shape of a sphere. A seismic wave is similar to the shock wave, except it travels down into the earth more slowly than shock wave. The speed of seismic compressional waves, or P waves, in real rocks varies from about, from about 1,500 meters per second in water to 6,000 meters per second in very rigid rocks like limestone. Hooke's law from high school physics is actually the foundation of uh, most se seismic processing. Here's a mass mounted between two springs fixed to the wall. The spring force balances out and keeps the mass in equilibrium. If I pull the mass to the right, the spring on the left is under more tension and exerts a greater force than the spring on the right. We're going to plot the horizontal motion of the mass as a function of time. I do that in this graph. At time zero, the mass is shifted to the right. When I release the mass, it will shoot to the left until it's stopped by the stretched right-hand spring. Then the mass will travel back to the right. Eventually, the mass comes to a rest because the spring loses potential energy and heat. If it didn't, the mass would oscillate forever. Let's plot a red curve for the mass's position as a function of time. We can also plot the velocity of the mass. The mass has maximum velocity when it moves past the equilibrium point and zero velocity when it's stopped by the spring force on either the left or the right side. So how does Hooke's law relate to seismology? You can think of the mass as a small cube of Earth. The adjacent cubes are the springs. If an earthquake or dynamite uh, moves the cube, it pushes down on its neighbor below and pulls on its neighbor above. If we were able to measure the pressure at each point in the slinky, we would notice that the pressure is high below the mass and lower just above it. This creates a moving disturbance, which is our P wave. The wave propagates downward. Now it's time to break out the slinky. There are two kinds of waves you can generate with a slinky. One is a P wave, also called a compressional wave or a longitudinal wave. The other type is an S wave, also called a shear wave or transverse wave. I fixed one end of the slinky tightly to a chair, then pulled back the other end and released it. You can see the wave travel down to the chair, reflect back, and hit my hand. It bounces back and forth several times before the oscillations die out. Now we can view the video at 1 8 speed so you can see the waves better. Next I moved backward, which puts more tension on the, on the uh, slinky and repeat. The wave takes 0.45 seconds to travel from a doorway to the chair and then back. Then I moved up which removes the tension on the slinky and repeated. This time it, put, it took uh, 0.78 seconds for the wave to travel from the door to the chair and back. What does this mean? It means that the wave uh, travels faster down a stiff, stiff spring. Guess what? Real, wa real waves travel faster in stiffer rocks too. Now it's time to generate an S wave. Instead of pulling the spring back, I whip the slinky from side to side. You can see a pulse travel down the chair and back. Now let's watch the same thing at 1 8 speed. Notice that I taped two slinkies together. One is metal while the other is plastic. Something very interesting happens when the wave hits the boundary. Part of the wave is reflected back to me. This happens because the two slinkies have a different stiffness. The same things happen 
thing happens when real waves hit a rock layer boundary. The polarity of the reflected wave is the same as the source. We can use this to tell that the plastic spring is stiffer than the metal spring. We can use the same logic to tell whether one rock layer is stiffer than another. More on that later. Now that you understand some of the basics of seismic waves in a one-dimensional sense, you're ready to learn about how waves propagate in three dimension in a real earth. Click on the video link below to go to the next installment.